During the 2001 Toronto Film Festival, promotional barf bags were handed out in a cheeky effort to let you know what you were about to be in for. It was reported that watching this film caused some viewers to draw up and another to faint. Just by watching the first 15 minutes of Ichi the Killer will test out your flight or fight instinct like nothing you've seen before. It is purely a visceral response. The big question is how much of this mayhem could anyone physically handle without, well, reaching for the barf bag? Let's set the scene. I'm not gonna show it here, but in the very first scene in Ichi the Killer, we see a pimp and he's viciously punching a prostitute in the face and he's raping her while outside on the balcony a man in a black latex bodysuit masturbates. Interested yet? And out of an animated puddle of semen emerges the title E.T. the Killer. And according to the director, that semen was 100% real. This is E.T. the Killer. It's disgusting, violent, politically incorrect to the max, and it's over the top in every way you could think of. But most important is, there's nothing else like it. So, this was a very controversial film when it first released. It was banned and heavily censored in many countries, and for that, it gave the director a name for himself. Takashi Miike, for those who don't know him, he's a fascinating director that makes films that are nearly impossible to recommend. Like the one I'm recommending right now. Just like with Ichi the Killer, many of his other films have been accompanied by mass walkouts, people fainting, or even throwing up in the aisles. While many of his films are worthy of this reputation, it's unfair to categorize all of his films into shock and awe. So amongst all this violence, exploitation, and horror, there's also some real questions being asked and discussed. For a man who makes an average of 3 films a year, to this date he's made well over 100 features, he's also had plenty of time to refine and explore some of those creations. So for this reason, Miike's films, despite there being so many of them, have a long lasting effect. They exist much more in the meta space that surrounds the film itself, more so than the action that plays out on screen. Visitor Q, for example, is probably his most controversial film. It follows a horrible, weird, and incestuous family. It was filmed in just 7 days, and it can appear as very cheap. However, its cheapness begins to look like a reality show after a while. But it's one that refuses to behave as one. Which is kinda appropriate, given the fact that it's a man trying to make a reality show about his weird family. It's a film that becomes so meta that it somehow manages to find itself back in reality again. Yes, it's horrible, but it's really a reflection of the film and TV industry, which constantly pushes drama solely for the sake of drama and controversy for the sake of controversy. By the end of that film, you might ask yourself why you even bothered to watch it, but Mike is asking you why you would want to watch anything. That's not to say though that Miike's films always engage the audience by upsetting them. With The Happiness of the Katakuris, it was a comedy about a family that runs an inn where all the guests just mysteriously die. And then they turn into zombies and then burst into song. It was basically a loose remake of The Sound of Music. But let's get back to Ichi the Killer. Takashi Miike's twisted 2001 film Ichi the Killer 
centers around a Yakuza masochist named Masao Kakihara. I who is following the disappearance of his Yakuza boss. It ends up diving into a plot that's concocted by Gigi, a man who is pulling all the strings to get his way. Gigi is using a sadistic living weapon known as Ichi the Killer to slaughter his way through the Yakuza. It's all to enact his own personal vendetta. However, while Kakihara is at first motivated for revenge, he soon seeks out Ichi just to find someone who can hurt him the same way that his old boss Andrew used to. Perhaps my favorite aspect of Ichi the Killer is in its main antagonist Kakihara. Well, maybe there's not really a main antagonist because none of the characters are good, but... Kakihara is basically a deranged David Bowie. And while both Kakihara's from the movie and the manga are both very charismatic in nature, I more so like the one from the film, mainly because of the way he looks. He dresses in this outlandishly loud clothing, some of which is just a spectacle to look at, like his crazy sharkskin suit. He does nothing but despicable things throughout the story and has a very strange love for pain, but for some reason, you're still drawn to his character. I'll also say that just the costume designs for the film are just a feast to look at. Sometimes the enjoyment I get from this film is just looking at all the outlandish leather jackets and flamboyant clothing styles that the various characters in Yakuza wear. I honestly wish that I could get away with wearing some of this stuff. So the film itself is most known for the ultra-violence, and some even rank it as the most violent movie ever made. Still, it has plenty to offer besides the ultra-violence. It's actually very well made, surprisingly. Takashi Miike went out of his way to fit so many small details into this one film that it's pretty incredible. It's one of those films where it's different every time you see it, if for some reason you were brave or crazy enough to watch it again. There's so many recognizable, great, and just stylized scenes and transitions. Like take this scene, Kakihara and his goons chase one of Gigi's men. The guy they're chasing thinks he's getting away, but there's the fearsome Kakihara and he's watering a plant for some reason as if he was waiting for an appointment. There's also a scene where Kakihara gets kicked out of the clan and instead of fighting it, he just peacefully walks out the door to everyone's surprise. Then, he walks back in a few seconds later. <laughs> stating that he's taking over the clan. <laughs> and then he walks back out. It's like something you would see from Columbo. Oh, uh, one other thing. Also, when Kakihara and his clan get exiled, he tells his members that they're now going to be hunted down and he'll understand if anyone wants to get out. Someone raises their hand and Kakihara just pulls out one of his skewers and then just stabs the guy's foot onto a plank of wood. It then transitions to a really badass scene where we see him and his clan walking down the street. We then see the guy walking with the board still attached to his foot. It's comedic, it's violent, and it's its own style. These are scenes that really just need to be seen to be appreciated. The film is full of them, and I can't help but feel like I've seen these somewhere else. So while E.G. the Killer is ultra-violent, it gives you two reactions. Either you're gonna cringe, or you're gonna laugh. I found myself laughing just because of how over the top the violence is. And I think it was intended to be viewed this way. Ah! 
it's almost too cartoony in nature to be taken serious. It's actually kind of fun, as sick as that sounds. It's a lot different though in style compared to Mike's other movie, The Audition, where that violence seemed very serious, and as a result it was much more disturbing than this, even though this film has way more violence. So, Ichi the Killer is a pretty demented story, but the film's infamous reputation often overshadows the fact that it's based on a manga of the same name. Hideo Yamamoto's original manga follows almost the same plot as the film, but there's a few subtle differences between the two that results in a different feeling for both. Plot lies, both the manga and film for Ichi the Killer are the same on paper. Many of the events play out in the film as they do in the original manga, which is pretty impressive that Mike was able to transfer that over the film. The difference is in how these events are showed. The Ichi the Killer manga is very internal psychologically, while the film is more about the internal pain that is externalized in the characters' actions and behaviors. For example, the manga spends a lot of time showing how Ichi is being demented, telling the readers that he's a pervert or he's violent. Where the film just shows this to the viewers and it leads you up to decide for yourself. In fact, Ichi's first scene in the film shows him masturbating to completion while a pimp violently rapes a prostitute. In contrast, the manga introduces Ichi crying after murdering someone. While the scene also happens in the film, it's very brief. Kakihur is also a little different in the manga compared to the film. For example, in the manga, he isn't as flamboyant as the actor Tadanobu Asano's character is portrayed. In the manga, he's much more sadistic, and we see him perform a lot more gruesome torture sequences, usually involving the... The most distinct change was made with the film's version of the ending. And this is going to be where I'm going to spoil the ending to the movie and the manga, so if you want to get out now, I'll give you time to do that. Otherwise, skip to this time. The manga ends with Ichi killing everyone, even Kakihara, and this is all part of Gigi's plan. However, Gigi realizes that Ichi is no longer the perfect killing machine that he needs. So he finds Takeshi, a young boy who has grown to idolize Ichi, and he turns him into a weapon for violence, just like he did for Ichi. Gigi may or may not have killed himself, we never know, but Takeshi does become a new weapon, continuing the cycle of violence. The film ends with Kakihura realizing that Ichi will not give him the satisfaction of pain. Kakihura stabs his own ears out, blocking out the sound of Ichi's incessant crying. Then he imagines getting killed by Ichi. In reality, he throws himself off of a building and he falls to his death, as indicated by the lack of injury to his skull. Ichi is ultimately killed by Takeshi, who, despite idolizing him as a hero earlier, he now sees him more for the sadistic and pathetic monster that he really is. In the end, Gigi hangs himself. The film's ending is far more ironic, with no one really getting a true happy ending. While the manga's end, is a lot more tragic and disturbing. The film's anticlimactic ending might feel less climactic and conclusive than the manga's ending, but it still fits Mike's style because it's showing that in the end no one wins or gets what they want. Despite this being such a disturbing movie and just depicting a lot of violence on women, it was still reported that a lot of women went to see it. People even went on dates to this movie, and I'm sure those are probably some great stories. I definitely don't recommend taking a date to see this movie. Ah! 
The producer of the film, Miyazaki, was feeling a bit dissatisfied with the quality of Japanese films, especially the Japanese films that were shown overseas, and just how they didn't really portray actual Japan. And he hoped to change that view with this film. <laughs> The actor Tadanobu Asano was actually Mike's first choice to cast the character of Kakihara. The producer Miyazaki also really liked Asano's performance in the films Focus and Moborosi. What I also thought was pretty cool was that Asano also really liked the Ichi the Killer manga. And just the fact that he gets to play the main character in this is pretty cool. When this film was being written, the manga was still ongoing. So the producer of the film didn't know how the story would end and neither did the manga writer at the time. So they took the basic setting and just let the story flow naturally. The producer of the film met with the manga writer Yamamoto and they also met with Yamamoto's psychiatrist who served as a supervisor. Together they were able to come up with what the character Kakihara wanted and also who the character Gigi is. They also came up with a psychological description of Ichi and his behaviors. The psychiatrist came up with all the psychological traits that these characters would have in real life. The film uses the real life setting of Kabakicho to just tell the motives of all the characters in the film. It's a place that has both a light and dark side to it. The character of Gigi lives there, and he knows he won't live forever, but Kabukicho itself will live forever. And so, the place that Gigi loves the most will live on even after he dies. Which is something that Gigi can't accept, so he wants to destroy the place. He wants to turn Kabukicho into an ordinary and boring place. So, he tries to get Kakihara and Ichi to fight each other. You can argue that Ichi the Killer is a love story. It's about Kakihara trying to find the person that he loves the most, his old boss. But later, his new love becomes Ichi, the one person that can deliver the amount of pain that he dreams of. I I think what ends up making Ichi the Killer so fascinating is the fact that we live in a very controlled world. We can't truly be ourselves anymore. In the world of Ichi the Killer, all the characters give in to their animalistic tendencies, and they run around free. It's like looking into a new world. From first glance, it looks like an insane world just full of wolves. But deep down, everyone's just being themselves, and no one is hiding anything. There is no limit, just like how Mike had no boundaries for the movie he created. And now we can see the full uncut version. And Yamamoto wrote his manga without any censors. It's generally what the artists envision. And in this censor heavy new society that we live in where even free speech is gone, something like Ichi the Killer will become something that we look back on and admire. In the end, Ichi the Killer is a perfect example of true free expression. Thanks for watching guys, and if you enjoy that, don't forget to subscribe and join my Patreon to discuss more topics and stuff that we love.